Welcome back to The Daily Word. We are in Galatians 5 this morning. Go ahead and turn to Galatians 5. And we're going to look at the verses 1 to 6. We'll do that in three parts. The purpose, the problem, and the practice. So Galatians 5, three parts, the purpose, the problem, and the practice. Why don't we begin with the purpose in verse 1. Now Paul explicitly tells us the purpose for which Christ set us free. What is it? It was freedom. He set us free for freedom. Okay, simple enough, but freedom from what? Well, if you go back to Galatians 3.13, it says Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. In other words, everyone who tries to keep the law but fails is under a curse because they didn't keep the law perfectly. And so Christ set us free from that by dying on the cross because and living perfectly and upholding all the law. And so Paul says we are set free from that curse. Uh, we're set free from trying to earn our righteousness. Uh, and then he says, given that that's true, that you've been set free from the curse of law, stand firm. In other words, don't abandon the gospel of grace. Stand firm. Don't, be, don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. When submit again, that means don't be oppressed by. Um, don't be this yoke of slavery would be the law, trying to earn salvation, trying to keep all the requirements of the law, the long list of do's and don'ts. Don't be subject to that again and be enslaved again as if now you could earn your salvation. Don't go back to law keeping as a way to merit heaven. That's what Paul is saying. It doesn't work, right? Law keeping doesn't work. It's exhausting and it's enslaving. And you can never please God because if you fail even one command, then, says James, you're guilty of breaking all of them. And so you're guilty of all and the curse falls upon you. So that is the purpose, section one. Now we get to the problem. Problem Paul explains in verse two. Look at verse two. Uh, if you accept circumcision, Christ is no advantage to you. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean no advantage, or you could say no benefit? Well, first, Paul's not saying circumcision itself is inherently bad, as if you shouldn't get circumcised. No, what he's saying is circumcision is bad when you get circumcised as if that will get you into heaven, as if it was a precondition to salvation. He says when you're circumcised, and he explains in verse 4, he says, justified by the law, when you're circumcised as a means of being made right before God, then that's the problem because law keeping never works. And if you do that, Christ is of no advantage to you because, as he says in verse 3, now you're supposed to keep the whole law. You've got to obey everything. Every jot and tittle, you better obey. And it's no longer what on the merits of Christ. It's on your merit. And so if you try to get circumcised, he's saying to the Galatians, as a way of, rather, as a way of being saved, then Christ and what he did is of no use to you because now it's all on your shoulders. You better keep the whole law perfectly or the curse of the law is back on your head. That's the problem. And then he says in verse 4, you're severed from Christ, which severed means separated from. You're estranged from Christ. He says, you would, who, you would um, be justified by the law. So anybody who's trying to be justified by law is separated from Christ because it's all on your shoulders, not on what Jesus has done. Then he says in verse 4, you have fallen from grace. Now some people wonder, oh, does that mean you can lose your salvation? Well, no, and we can look at the totality of Scripture, and it's very clear, even Romans 8, that there's no losing your salvation. So I don't think Paul is teaching, and I know he's not teaching you can lose your salvation. Instead, I would argue what Paul is saying is, listen, you Galatians, if now you're believing that your salvation is accomplished by grace plus works, then Christ is of no benefit to you. You have exited the realm of grace. You have entered the realm of law. And now, if you continue in that path, and if you don't repent and go back to the real gospel, 
then you will prove that you were never saved in the beginning. Now you never had true salvation. And so you've fallen from grace because you were in the atmosphere of grace and, and you heard the truth, but yet you didn't really buy it because you thought, no, I must supplement Jesus by my own good deeds or some sort of religious work or ritual. Well, if that's the case, if that's the gospel you believe and then you die believing that gospel, then you have indeed been severed from Christ, fallen from grace. You were never saved at all. I think that is what Paul is saying. And so that's, actually, that's, that's the case for many people today who go to church. They've heard the true gospel over and over again, and they would even perhaps affirm it, and yet in their hearts... What they're actually trusting in is the fact that they were baptized as a baby or baptized as an adult or the fact that they are a member of a church or the fact that they attend church regularly and never miss. That's the same idea is trusting in some external work as the means of salvation. And that is a damning heresy. That is a false gospel. That is the problem. And you couldn't get a more serious or severe problem than that. Now we move to the part, part three, the practice. This is verses five and six, and Paul describes the practice of true believers, of, of real salvation. Here's what real salvation looks like. It doesn't look like earning your way to heaven by doing good. It looks like, in verse five, um, we through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. True believers, they don't seek to create or build their own righteousness. Instead, they by faith look to the imputed righteousness of Christ and they trust in his righteousness. They trust in what Christ did. And so it is a by faith, by looking to what Jesus did, by trusting in what Jesus did, that's the righteousness that they're seeking after. And verse six says, that spirit, that person, the the fruit, the byproduct, it will be manifested in, as the end of uh, verse 6 says, faith working through love. So in other words, their true, genuine, authentic faith will produce real works. It will produce works of love. Love will motivate the believer to obey Christ. Love will motivate the believer to love other Christians, to love non-Christians. But it'll be love motivated by faith. And that love will express itself in obedience. Not obedience in unto salvation, but obedience because of what Christ has done. Because of gratefulness for what Jesus has done. So that's the true practice. And indeed, that's what Paul would be calling the Galatians toward. Not towards this mixture, this potent concoction of grace plus works. Well, that's all for today. We will see you tomorrow for the last daily word, with me at least, Galatians chapter 6. Take care.